Eternal Father, again we thank thee for the privilege of an open word. Again we praise thee for thy mercy in preserving it and giving it and illuminating it for our admonition, learning. Bless us now. We thank thee that we can put aside the troubles and the anxieties and the pressures of the day and spend an hour with thy book. May the sweet spirit with his illuminating, warming presence be here to make these words shine with light and truth and directive. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation 12 ends with the declaration that Satan, dragon, serpent, devil, is angry with the woman and goes to make war with the remnant of her seed. And this remnant is possessed of two distinguishing marks. Keeps the commandments of God and has the faith of Jesus. Now we ask ourselves the question, how is this wrath against the woman displayed? Remember I've said, each section of the book of Revelation links into the next. And the question or the suggestion posed by the terminal point of one little segment is answered in the next segment. How is the dragon going to show his wrath against the remnant of the woman's seed? Now the woman we have noted, is a symbol, when she is pure, of the bride of Christ. When she indulges in adulterous relationships with the state, with the kings of the earth, such as in Ezekiel 16 and many other parts of the Old Testament symbolic writings, she's an apostate, she's a harlot woman. She's pure, she is loving and serving and loyal to her bridegroom who is Jesus Christ. So the woman here has a seed. And the seed of the woman is first Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 15 and 16. He didn't say seeds in the plural, but in the singular. And to thy seed which is Christ. And then in the twelfth chapter of the book of Matthew... You will remember Jesus talked about a husbandman who put good seed in his field. And while men slept, the enemy came and put tares. When they were grown up, then appeared the tares also. And after a while, the disciples came to him and said, Tell us, what is the meaning of the parable of the sower and the seeds and the tares? And he says, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The evil seed are the children of the wicked one. The devil that sowed the evil seeds, he is the enemy. So when it talks about the seed of the pure woman, it's the children of the kingdom. It starts with Christ. And then his brothers and sisters, good people. The woman is first noted in Genesis 3. And there the Lord made a prediction to the woman and to Satan that the time would come when the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head and in turn himself would have his heel bruised. Now where I grew up there were lots of snakes known as karites. A big karite was about as thick as my first finger. About half an inch in diameter. They weren't very long either. A long karite was about 18 inches long. The average karite, I imagine, was about 14 inches long. Some of them were thin as my little finger. And my brother and I have killed many karites. What we'd have fun doing when we saw this thing 
would be to try to leap up and come down with our heels on top of its head. Now I think I have got a little enlargement of my brain since those stupid days. But uh, bruising the serpent's head with your heel was something that as a little boy I used to like to do. And he and I have leapt up many a time and taken sight and come right down on this thing's head with our heel. And then watch the rest of it wriggle right over your foot till it was finally killed. The best way to kill a serpent is to, is to smash his head. Don't get anywhere near his fangs, even if you do that, if he's poisonous. And the karite was very poisonous. And so long ago, the Lord predicted that uh, the serpent, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, would have his brains crushed out by the heel of the seed of the woman. The seed, of course, is primarily Christ, and then Christ's brothers and sisters who would encounter the seed, and in the prediction that was made, thou shalt tread upon serpents, and they shall not bite thee. The victory guaranteed to the seed. I love that. And God has told us this beforehand, that we may take courage. We know the answer. The head of the serpent is going to be bruised, smashed. We know the answer. So when the serpent is trying to fling against us venom from his mouth to destroy us, God has promised us victory. So Revelation 12 verse 17 ends with a description of the conflict, the final conflict. The dragon knows that he has but a short time. That's the end of verse 12 of Revelation 12. He knoweth that he hath a short time. So what does he do? He turns all his fury against the seed of the woman. The remnant of the seed of the woman. As we have considered in previous studies, every epoch had a remnant of the seed of the woman who was the object of satanic fury, satanic hatred. And in the last days, in the last conflict, Satan is going to make a last attempt. But as in every other epoch, the answer has been given beforehand. Serpent's head is going to be bruised by the seed which is Jesus Christ. John continues. Now, how is this going to take place? I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea. In Daniel chapter 7 verse 2, Daniel also saw beasts rising out of the sea. Ferocious beasts, rapacious beasts. And the beasts, let's look for a moment at Daniel 7 and get the biblical explanation of the beast that rises out of the sea. I spake and saw, verse 2, strove the winds of heaven on the great sea and great beasts came up. Now what are these beasts? Verse 17. These beasts are for kings, or as verse 23 said, kingdoms, fourth kingdoms. The same word is translated beast in verse 17 as is translated beast uh, as kingdom in verse 23. The beasts are kings, the beasts are kingdoms. Beast king, beast kingdom, same thing. So from the sea comes a beast. Now what does this sea, these great waters? Let's turn to the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation to get the definitive sentence there. Verse 15. The waters which thou sawest are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. Now these waters are given to us first at the end of verse 1 of chapter 17. The great horse sitteth upon many waters. Vast oceans of waters. Seas they're called in Daniel 7, 2 and 3. 
Now, the Bible uses waters in many different ways. Rain, dew, cloud, springs, streams, rivers, and seas. Each of those uses is particular and specific. The coming down of the Holy Spirit to wash and refresh is called the latter rain. The nurturing philosophy of life by which our minds are irrigated are called rivers or streams. And the great waters, the seas over which the tornadoes of strife and conflict rage and the waves roar are peoples. Restless, moving, undisciplined, unpredictable peoples. So from peoples, restless seas of people, John witnesses a beast which is a kingdom emerge. And this beast had seven heads and ten horns. Turn back to chapter 12 and verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven, a red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. Things which are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. So there is a mysterious connection between the dragon with seven heads and ten horns and this beast that emerged out of the sea. Now notice the clue. At the end of verse 3 of, of Revelation 12, the heads had seven crowns. Now in Revelation 13.1, the horns had crowns, ten crowns. So both the beasts have seven heads. And you, re you recollect that when we studied that, those seven heads were the seven head manifestations of the special persecuting energy of Satan across the centuries. And I was bold enough to name the seven as Egypt, Israel, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the papacy. The greatest persecutors that the world has ever seen. And I could see by your wrinkled brow and your queried eye that you wondered how Israel ever got into that list of persecutors. And you will recollect that I mentioned when the king of Israel formed affiliation with Jezebel that the combination produced perhaps the most corrosive, persecutive, destructive combination that the world has ever seen. And the prophet Elijah felt that he was the only survivor. But the Lord had to comfort him with the true statistics that in all the world there were only 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal. I hope in other ages there were more than 7,000. Now, one of those heads was to have ten horns according to Daniel 7. That was the Roman head. And out of those ten horns was to em emerge another little horn. Now in Revelation 13 verse 1, those ten horns predicted in Daniel 7 were crowned kings, so they had received the kingdom. They were the kings, they were the regnant power. The Roman head was crushed in the year 476 A.D., the fall of the Roman Empire. And following the fall, the ten barbarian kingdoms, and I don't want to press the identity of those ten too hard, they varied from eight or nine to twelve, 
But the ten is paralleled by the ten toes of the beast, uh, of, the, of the image of Daniel 2, rather. Head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and feet of reinforced concrete, iron and miry clay. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the tenfold splintering and petering out of the Roman Empire. So we have come to the time following 476, when the ten horns were crowned king. And from those ten, he sees this power that has the names of blasphemy. Well, let's turn back to Daniel 7 and see what Daniel 7 has to say about what emerged from the ten horns. Verse 7 ends with, Daniel 7, 7, The beast had ten horns, and I considered, and out of them came another little horn. And what was this little horn doing? Verse 21, I saw the same horn make war with the saints. Revelation 12, verse 17, with the remnant of the saints. Verse 24. And another shall arise among the ten kings, and he shall be diverse, he shall subdue three, he shall speak great words against the Most High. See what he does? He speaks great words against the Most High. At the end of verse 20. A mouth that spake very great things. Arrogant, blasphemous statements against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And among other things, according to Daniel 7.25, he shall think to change the times and the laws. Or as one translation puts it, he shall think to change the law concerning time. And the only law concerning time that the Decalogue contains is the fourth commandment. It deals with six days work and seventh day rest. And the little horn was thinking to change the law concerning time. Besides blasphemous statements against God and persecuting, wearing out the saints of the Most High. And in verse 25 of Daniel 7, he shall continue for a time, times and a dividing of times. The word time means a year. It's the biggest measure of time known to the, to the, to the Jews. The second word, times, is in the dual. It means two times. They are a singular, a dual, and a plural, three or more. So here are three and one half times, or three and a, one half years. All right, let's turn back to Revelation 13. This power that he saw, verse 5, had a mouth speaking great things. Exactly as Daniel had said. And blasphemies. And power was given to him to continue 42 months. 42 months at 12 months a year is three and a half years. So Daniel says it will continue for three and a half years. Revelation says it will continue for 42 months. And if we go back to Revelation 12, verse 14, the second part of it, this should continue for a time, times, and half a time, three and a half years. So the, exactly the same clues are given in Revelation 13 and part of 12 that are given in Daniel chapter 7. This power, this kingdom, this beast, this wild beast, fierce beast, was to arise from the turbulent of the populated world. And from that turbulence was to emerge with ten horns, and out of those ten horns would come a little horn. Would be characterized with a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy against God. Would think to change the laws concerning time. Would wear out the saints of the Most High. Verse 7 of Revelation 13. It was given to him to make war with the saints, to overcome them. Power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and people. 
became a universal church. All that dwell on the earth shall worship him. So everywhere upon the earth you're going to find followers. The word, another word for universal is Catholic. Everywhere it's to be found. Predicted when it would arise. After the fall of the Roman Empire. After the establishment of the barbarian kingdoms. From among them would arise one. Happened to arise in the boot that is Italy. With the headquarters in Rome. Would uh, carry out the various items that are made here. Now some years ago I decided one day I would make a list of all the clues that the Bible gave for identifying the little horn. And so far I have 110. I may have missed a few in my counting here and there, but I have 110. Now I am not a, a lawyer. But I've thought to myself many times, if ever I was a lawyer, and I had to identify, bring about the identity of this little horn in a court of law, I would approach it from 110 different lines of approach. I'd write a paragraph or a chapter on each of them. 110. And there is only one power in the history of the world to which all 110 clues apply. You can take some that may apply to this and may apply to that. Others that may apply to this power and may apply to that power. Still others that may apply to other powers. But when you get all 110 focusing on the little horn, in my book there is not the slightest dubiety about it. And that power is the power of the papacy. That reached its first Strength under Gregory the Great. If you want to put in your mind a figure for Gregory the Great, put 600. Been point 600. His power would arise. 400 years later, plus or minus, Leo the Great. Those two men lifted the papacy on, into its zenith. That emperor that gave to the papacy the right of life and death over heretics was Justinian. And his decree came into effect in the year 538. The beginning of the 42 months prophetically, three and a half years prophetically, 1260 days prophetically, which meant 1260 years. Started in 538, ended in 1798. A time during which the papacy was absolutely dominant. And then as John looks at this hybrid power in verse 2, that had something of the swiftness and the cunning of the leopard, the rapacity of the bear, the dominance and arrogance of the lion, he saw one of its heads, the papal head, wounded to death. Now, for 1260 years, this must, power must remain dominant. So it's at the end of the 1260 years that the death wound was to be made. And it's much more than a coincidence that exactly 1260 years after death to the heretic became the slogan in 538, that in 1798 the Pope was taken prisoner by the general from Napoleon marched into Rome. General Berthier took the Pope prisoner, brought him as a captive to France, locked him up in a castle. There he died two years later. And the reaction of historians, current and who look back on it, Papacy was finished. Prophecy had looked forward 1800 years and say that power would receive a deadly wound. But then he adds in verse 3, and his deadly wound was healed. 
That death blow passed away. When the Pope was taken prisoner, the Papal States came to an end. The Pope was a bishop, no longer a king. But in the year 1929, Cardinal Gaspari, on behalf of the Vatican, signed the Concordat with Mussolini, by which the Pope became king again, sovereign in his own right. And from that day, ambassadors have been sent into every kingdom in the world, every government in the world. The Pope became king again. The, the papacy, deadly wound, healed. And as the prophecy continues, all the world wondered after the papacy. This word is admired, respected, revered. And they worshipped the beast, verse 4, whose deadly wound was healed, and said, Who is like the beast? Who will make war with it? Notice the approach. Here is a power, a universal power, to which the world is looking and saying, what power is like the papacy? Who would dare make war with the papacy? Now if you bring to bear around that statement, clustering round it, other passages in the Bible, from the book of Revelation. The nations were angry. The trumpet of war is sounding. You are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nation is going to rise against nation and kindred against kingdom. Kindred. Strife is going to be found across the earth's far ends, as Moffat translated it. Faced with this kind of threat of universal destructive war, and Jesus comes, Revelation 11, 18 ends with he's going to destroy those who are destroying the world. There's only once in the history of the world when men have power to destroy it. You couldn't destroy the world if you had 10 million bows and arrows. You couldn't destroy the world if you had 10 million Lee Enfield 303 rifles. But man, for the first time in his history, has got power to destroy the world. Revelation looked 1,800 years to that time. And John hears the cry for safety, for security. Who is like the papacy? Who would make war with him? Remarkable prophecy. A remarkable focus of many prophecies onto our day and generation. As men look to this healed, restored, world, prestigious power, we are told in verse 8 that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Those whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then the addition that is peculiar to Revelation, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Now Jesus said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But the thrust, I think, the emphasis here, is that even if you can half hear, if you, even if you have only one ear, listen very carefully. And then, <clears throat> verse 10, this power, he that leads into captivity, shall be led into captivity. That's 1798. He that killeth with the sword must himself be killed with the sword. To see this, to discern this, you will have to find the patience and the faith of the saints. Wait for it. So in our study of the first half of Revelation 13, 
We have come to the year 1798. And I beheld, John says, another beast coming up out of the earth. In verse 1, it was coming out of the sea. In verse 11, it's coming out of the earth. Now if the waters, the great waters, the seas, refer to peoples and multitudes and nations and languages, then the earth that has no water will be territory without peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And when we came in our study to Revelation 12, we saw verse 13 and verse 15 and 16 that the earth helped the woman by swallowing up whatever the dragon spat out of his mouth to try to overwhelm. And from a spitting serpent you get all kinds of poison, propaganda, ridicule, hatred, vituperation, legislation. And the earth absorbed, saved the woman. Now from the earth, uninhabited territory, there emerges a horn, a, a, a beast, a power. Not from the surging, raging, wind-swept seas, but from the quiet, placid, uninhabited, dry land. Now where around 1798, in territory that was not populated like those lands from which the papacy had risen in the old world, where in territory previously unoccupied was a kingdom, a government, a beast, with certain qualities, lamb-like qualities, two horns like a lamb, Peaceful, sylvan, bucolic, territory previously unoccupied. Well, now look over the historic scene round about 1798 and ask yourself where? What parts of the world were then really unoccupied? Australia? South America? Very slimly populated. North America? Siberia? Where around 1798 was a power rising? Which according to the rest of the text would require a development into a world power. Well, there was only one place. That was North America very slimly populated. From it, a nation was rising. The language that is used, for example, coming up, is an interesting word in the Greek. It means to grow imperceptibly and silently as a plant. That's what the Greek means. No fanfare, no great battle, no triumphant march, no weeping widows. Growing up quietly, silently as a plant. He had two horns. In the scriptures, a horn is a symbol of strength and power that either pushes aggressively or defends. In the book of Habakkuk, one of the shorter prophets, there is a verse that I think will throw light on this. The third chapter of Habakkuk describes the second coming of Christ. And as he descended in splendor, 
Verse 3, glory, his glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. He had, verse 4, horns, horns coming out of his hand and there was the hiding or the secret of his power. So the horn is a symbol of power. Secret of his power. Now this lamb-like beast had two horns. Two areas that were the hiding of his power. And here around 1798, in territory previously unoccupied, a power was arising with two major strengths. Didn't happen in Australia, didn't happen in Siberia, didn't happen in South America. But in North America, a power was arising whose strength rests on two horns, two secrets of power. Freedom to worship God according to the dictates of your conscience and a democratic free people. Those are the two secrets on which the strength of the United States of America have been built. Freedom of worship, separation of church and state, democratic approach to both. Live let live religiously and uh, politically. But as he observed it, he saw a dramatic change occur in verse 11. He, this power, spoke as a dragon. Now what is the force of the word spoke? How does a government speak? by legislating. This lamb-like, quietly, plant-like growing power from 1798 on suddenly brings legislation that is draconic. Spoke as a dragon. And he, in the United States, exercised all the power of the first beast that was before him. Of the papacy in the old world that led into captivity, that destroyed with a sword. Now what I am reading here are the chill realities of prophecy yet unfulfilled. This hasn't happened yet. The United States has not made draconic laws yet. The United States is not exercising in this freedom, religious, free land the power of the papacy in the old world. There are no inquisitors. There's no rack. There's no faggot. There's no dungeon for religious dissenters. Has for 1260 years crushed and eroded the flower of Europe. We haven't seen this prophecy fulfilled yet. And you know when I read this, and think about it, in the warmth and quietness of my study, or of this auditorium, and realize that on the isle that is called Patmos, the aged John took quill to parchment and described in brief strokes the rise of the United States. Territory previously unoccupied, quiet development, world sovereignty, resting its strength on freedom of worship, freedom of government, 
suddenly from its hallowed legislative halls comes the voice of the dragon. Draconic laws. I feel the chill of reality down my spine. Eighteen hundred years ago on the isle that is called Patmos. Don't shrug it off. Everything else in this matchless book has happened. This will not fail. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. And he causeth, brings to bear the earth, this North American continent, and them which are now dwelling in it. It's no longer territory unoccupied. To worship the first beast whose deadly wound is healed. The wound healed in 1929. So all this is subsequent to 1929. And he doeth great wonders. So that he maketh fire come down from heaven. On the earth. In the sight of men. Now I know the temptation of some expositors. Of trying to say this is the. Atomic flash. This is the control of the electric bolt. But let's use the same principles as we've used all the time. Let the Bible explain itself. Fire coming down from heaven. What are the precedents in biblical story? When else has fire come down from heaven in the sight of men? Just think. Burning bush. Pillar of fire. Fire flashing from heaven and Gideon's altar. Fire flashing from heaven and Solomon's altar. Fire flashing from heaven and Elijah's altar. Cloven tongues of fire flashing from heaven and lighting on the heads of the Spoke in Pentecost in the upper room. Take your concordance and add to this list. What are all these manifestations of fire? Our God is a consuming fire. What does he want to consume? The dross. He's not willing that any should perish. He's given his son that everyone should live. God's not interested in burning up. God's interested in purging. And the fire used in the Bible as a symbol of the divine presence that purges and accepts. When the fires were taken from the altar and touched Isaiah's lips, purged those lips. And by that act signaled heaven's acceptance of the young prophet. When cloven tongues of flame leaped from the brows of the disciples in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, their tongues were aflame with the gospel of salvation. Light was kindled that has never died in the darkness of the earth. And I submit that Revelation 13, verse 13, is a prediction of a second Pentecost. A pseudo Pentecost. It's not that God brings fire from heaven this time. It's that this power makes it appear that there is fire descending from heaven. To add credence to its worship. Verse 4 of the beast in face of a universal threat to war. And he deceived those who dwelled on, dwelt on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do. The miracles in the scriptures always have a religious thrust to give credence, to give confidence to religious leaders. Chase it through the Bible. Here in North America, if I read these prophecies aright, 
There is going to be a rival, a revival of religion that will apparently duplicate Pentecost, that will multiply miracles. What will they do? Verse 14, saying to them that dwell on the earth, this is to happen all on the earth in North America, that they should make an image to the beast whose deadly wound was healed and he lived. This is another clear-cut prediction of the establishment in North America of a form of religion exactly the same as the papacy in the old. Now there are two stages in this image making and the two stages are signaled by two prepositions. In verse 14 that they should make an image to the beast. And in verse 15, we find the image of the beast. You can make a memorial to President Kennedy that could take the shape of a hospital or a playing field or an orphanage. But if you made an image of him, that would be a replica of him in appearance. And so the stages of this prophetic fulfillment are first something done in honor of, as an honor to, and then a copy. First, notice what he says in verse 14, saying to them, legislatively saying to them, to make something in honor to, an image to the beast which had the wound and lived. And then giving power to the image of the beast that the image of the beast here in North America should do two things. Should both speak action of legislative authority and cause put teeth into enforce. First of all it's persuasive. Then their laws then those laws are enforced. And in the final enforcement of those laws, at the end of verse 15, that those who would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. A restoration of the death penalty. Now what I would suggest that in the cards, in the IBM, in your brain, in the computer, you put all these facts down and watch as they're being fulfilled. These are all future. The United States has not yet said, let's establish here a religion similar to the religion in the old world. It's not said, let's do something to honor the religion in the old world. It's not said, let us make an exact replica of it and then reinforce it with legislation and back up the legislation, if need be, with death decrees. This has not yet happened. The prediction is that it will happen. Now, how it's going to happen, nobody knows. But in the context of verse 4, who is like the beast? Who will make war with him? The context in which, apparently, men get ready to go to such lengths is threat of devastating war. 
Let's look back at Revelation 11, 18. The nations were angry. Every psychologist that I've ever talked to calls anger one of the most corrosive, self-destructive emotions. Anger. And that verse ends with, Thou shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. This anger leads to self-destruction. Now that's not quite as ridiculous as it might sound on the surface. I think we, most of us have read the book, Is Paris Burning? Hitler's orders that Paris should be burned to the ground. Many orders he gave. Knowing that his end was inevitable. Destroy. Destroy. Defend Berlin, die in defending it. Fight in every room, fight behind every wall, go down fighting. Self-destructive anger. The world, according to prophecy, reaches that nadir of wicked stupidity. Self-destructive anger. How are we going to survive this war? And then the suggestion is, is there anyone, any power, any organization like the papacy? Who would make war with him? If everyone became a papist, then there would be no war. Let's make a copy. Let's make an image of the Roman hierarchy. Let's get a replica. here in the United States. And let's support that replica with laws. Let's legislate. And if talking doesn't do, and he spake, saying to them that dwell on the earth, if talking and propaganda doesn't do, let's make laws. And then let's enforce those laws. And let's go to the length of enforcing those laws to make a death penalty attached to them. And so we go right back to verse 11, of chapter 13. These two horns, religious liberty, political freedom, freedom of expression, is now completely destroyed by the speaking of the dragon. The whole processes by which the power grew up after 1798 in a territory previously unoccupied. The whole bases of strength crumble and totter and are destroyed. And what we hear is the voice of the dragon. An angry dragon. Revelation 12 verse 14. The dragon was wroth with the woman. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who knows how? We've seen in the dark ages how they made war on the saints. How nations were, ra were raised against nations. How armies of tens of thousands marched into Bohemia, marched into other countries of the Europe to destroy and smother those who refused to accept the dictates of Rome. So in the old world we see the armies marching. In the new world we see legislations. In the old world we see the beast with his wound healed. In the new world we see an image of the beast. And we hear the voice of the dragon. And we imagine the legislation of that voice. And the sounding out of the threat of the death penalty. But now let's go back to verse 8. He killeth with the sword. 
verse 10. And verse 8, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. This is the secret. There is a group that are described as having the patience and the faith of the saints. Patience and faith of the saints. At the end of verse 10. Whose names are written in the book of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. They are the remnant of the seed. They keep the commandments of God. They have the faith of Jesus. They have the testimony of Jesus. They have the patience of Jesus. The Lamb is their Lord. They are written in the book. You know, long years ago, we used to sing a song, Is My Name Written There? And I want to close our meditation with that question tonight. Is your name written there? In that book? As we look through this sinister prophecy, focusing on our time, mainly